Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at The Rock. Deborah and I are going to team teach today and next week also. Deborah, are you coming to church today? Get up here. And uh, so... Uh, and, and so let's just do this. Let's everybody stand and let's go before the Lord in prayer and let's get into the things of God. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that we haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come to hear from a woman, but we have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. All the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching the gospel and are hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you would bless them always and also Bless them, Father. Bless our Baptist brothers, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center. Thank you for the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination, Ecclesia, Emmanuel Baptist. We thank you, Father, for uh, the great churches out there, Trinity. Uh, We thank you, God, for our brothers and sisters in the Catholic faith and our brothers and sisters in Adventist faith. At no time, Father, do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together, one field, building one kingdom, not a man's, but yours. So Lord, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing them. Cause the word of God to be alive on the inside of us today, Lord, and we'll give you all the praise, give you all the glory. Everybody with a great big shout, how about a amen? amen. Thanks, honey. Well, welcome. Um, My name is Deborah Cobra. You can call me Debbie or anyone, but I'm married to Jim, and uh, we have the great privilege of pastoring this church, and it's always a privilege to stand in this pulpit and to bring the Word of God, and so my piece this morning is to open this up and to give you a little bit of history, and then we're going to look at Mary, and then Pastor Jim's coming back up to look at Joseph, but the title of today's message is Lessons from His Parents. And this is not a history lesson. Everything in God's word means something. God is speaking constantly and continually. In Romans chapter 1, it says that creation speaks of the Godhead, that no one will be able to stand before the throne of God and say, I didn't know. Because even the very creation in our world that God has created says and speaks continually to us of the Godhead. And so... God wants to bring us a message this morning, not just about history, but also a message that will bring relevance and application to our lives. Because if it's just history and I walk away and think, oh, that's nice, the nativity, but if I don't see how that nativity and the things that happened to Mary and Joseph, I can apply those principles in my life today in the 21st century, then I'm missing what God wants from me. So I want you to pick up your ears and listen. I'm going to give you three things this morning about Mary, and then Jim's coming back to share with Joseph. But let me lay some history. It's been 400 years since the last book of the, of the Old Testament, Malachi, was written, and it's called The Years of Silence. There is no word of God. Rome is now raised up, and it is now in control, and they are seated in Jerusalem, and Although Israel is practicing their Jewish law and the temple has been rebuilt in Jerusalem, Rome is still the Lord over them. And they are longing and waiting for Messiah, and there has been no word. And then Matthew opens up his book, and Luke opens up his book with angel activity. And we see that in Luke chapter 1, that the angel Gabriel, and by the way, there's only two angels in the word of God that are named. Gabriel, who stands before the throne of God, And Michael, who was named in the book of Daniel as the prince over the house of Israel, protector. And Gabriel stands, and there, Zacharias, as he is giving incense and burning incense in the temple in Jerusalem, Gabriel sends to him a message and says, you're going to have a son. He's going to be called John the Baptist. He'll be a Nazarene. He will herald the way of the Lord. So we see that activity. And then six months later, we see in the book of Luke, if you go with me there, in Luke chapter 1, Gabriel now 
Verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So we see now that six months later, so Elizabeth is six months pregnant, carrying John the Baptist, and Gabriel now goes to Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a city in Israel that has no reputation of anything good. It is a city known for its sin. There was a Roman garrison two miles away from it. It would be much like the city of San Bernardino. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, Nathaniel said, under that tree? And so Gabriel is sent to Nazareth. Now, there's a couple that are about to come into the scene, Mary and Joseph. Mary is probably between 14 and 16 years old. Jewish tradition tells us that girls, as soon as they had their, their menstrual cycle, that they were betrothed in marriage as young children, and then they were given in marriage at a very young age. Now, the men were about 25 when they were given in marriage because they had to have a profession and they had to have gone through some type of training so they could support the wife. So probably, statistically, Mary was a young teenager. Joseph was probably in his early 20s. But she's been betrothed to Joseph, and that means that they are legally married, although they have not, although they have not consummated the marriage. It's an engagement. In Jewish law, it held the same strength as a marriage, and if they were going to break that engagement, it would be considered a divorce. Are you with me? So now their lives are set, okay? So here comes Gabriel in verse 27. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice! Highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Then Mary said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Having looked at that, we're going to look at three things this morning that Mary did and how those three things can apply directly to your life and to my life this morning. Are you ready? Number one, Mary was eligible. The angel of the Lord, if you can put it up on the overhead, the angel of the Lord said to Mary in Luke 1, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now that word highly favored is the Greek word harito. Now you and I don't speak Greek, but this is an important word because it's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. Harito, it means to have favor beyond that of just normal grace. Heaven bends low and gives you what you need. You are eligible to do what you've never been able to do. Not because you've earned it, not because you've done something, but God has said, hail, highly favored one. Now, God said that to Mary and said, Mary, you're eligible. But watch this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 is the other place that this word is found in the New Testament. In Ephesians 1, chapter 6, it says, To the praise of the glory of his grace. Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, describing the unbelievable inheritance of sonship that you and I have as children of God. And he says, And to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That word accepted right there is the same word, harito, that was given to Mary. So what God is saying is, Mary, you are eligible by my divine selection. I choose you to be the mother of my son. You are highly favored. And then he goes ahead and he says, saints of God, I choose you to be the receptors of my son. You are highly favored because you see the word of God came to Mary. She was eligible. Then we're going to see that the word of God was deposited in Mary. 
she was available. And then we're going to see that the word of God grew in Mary and then was delivered through her to the earth. She was willing. And it's the same scenario with you and I. God comes to us, deposits in us, and bursts through us the kingdom of heaven to our generation. It's no different. You're not birthing the Son of God. He has already come. But he, because he's the head and we're the body, is now delivering his word to us. He has made us eligible. Harito, we are highly favored of God as much as the virgin was who was picked by God to deliver her son. And if you think about it, church, of all the people in all the world, of all the billions of human beings that were born on this planet, from eon to eon, from age to age, God chose just two. Mary and Joseph, they were pretty special. And yet the same anointing and the same favor that is on them is on you and is on me by right of birth of Jesus Christ. So we see that, number one, Mary was eligible as are you and I. Number two, Mary was available. She was available to the word that was coming to her. In Luke 1, 37 and 38, it says... The angel Gabriel says, for with God, nothing is impossible. And Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Mary heard the word of Gabriel, and she did not see death in that word. She saw life in that word, and she received it. She believed it, and it was deposited on the inside of her. She was available. Now, my question to you is, what are you believing God for? How available are you to the living word of God that is coming to us? You see, Mary didn't see death in that word because she could have. She could have seen death. After all, she's engaged to Joseph. What do you mean I'm going to be pregnant? I've never known a man. Well, when that gets settled in her mind that it's going to be the Holy Spirit, she understands that now... Things could really get mucked up in her life, right? How is she going to tell Joseph? Who's going to believe her? She didn't reject that assignment. She said, be it unto me according to your word. When the word of God comes to you and to me, there's always a chance and a choice that we have to make. There's always a choice. Are we available? Or are we not available? And I love what Mary said. She said, be it unto me according to your word. And Mary, when she asked that question of Gabriel, she said, how am I going to have a baby? I've never known a man. She wasn't asking a question of unbelief. She was asking, this has never happened on the earth. I've heard of old people having children. And I remember Sarah and Abraham, they had a baby when they couldn't have a baby. But Gabriel, I'm, I'm a virgin. I've, I've never been with a man. How is this going to happen? She was asking a very good question. And Gabriel said, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and the Holy Spirit will come upon you and that which is born of you will be the Son of God. And what God is saying is, I want to do what's never been done in your life. I want to do what you've never seen and what you've never experienced. And beloved, if we're looking at this nativity scene and if we're looking at lessons from his parents then not just a, a history lesson of what Mary did but how about what Mary did so I can do it how about in 2012 Deborah Cobray what is it you're believing God for what has never been done in your life that you need to say be it unto me according to your word what is it in your life that you've been waiting for for a very long time what is it has there been years of silence like Israel 400 years where God didn't speak. Then all of a sudden, boom, here it comes, suddenly. Because he is the God of suddenly. What is it in your life that you've waited for and waited for and waited for? And all of a sudden, maybe God is coming to you and saying, I am making you eligible. You are eligible now to believe me for what has never been done. But my question is, Mary was available. Will you and I be available to believe again what hasn't happened? So she was eligible. She was available. And the last one before Jim comes up, she was willing to pay the price. Because with every word of God and with every assignment from God, there'll be a cost. It's going to cost God 
but it's also going to cost us. It's going to cost us some things, and this is what it costs Mary. Let's see. How about reputation? If you're going to have the word of God come to you, have the word of God deposit in you and grow in you, and then the word of God being delivered through you, the kingdom of heaven to the generations that you have influence with, guess what it's going to cost? It's going to cost reputation. It costs Mary her reputation. Who's going to believe her? Oh, yeah, you're pregnant with God. Right. Will Joseph believe her? Will her parents believe her? Why, there's a Roman garrison two miles from the city. Sure, somebody probably just got drunk and raped her, and she didn't want to tell anybody. Or maybe she and Joseph just couldn't wait for the wedding. And the reason that reputation followed her the rest of her life was because in John chapter 8, verse 41, when Jesus is a grown man, and he's speaking very directly to the Pharisees and to the Sanhedrin, he says to them, you do the deeds of your father, speaking of Satan. Now, they're mad at him, and this is what they say. John 8, 41. Then they said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father. God. We're not born of fornication. Why did they say that? Because they knew the history of Jesus' birth. They knew that Mary was pregnant before she married Joseph. It followed them all the days of their life. And when you and I say yes to Jesus Christ, we say goodbye to reputation because we have no reputation to maintain or to create because I am dead in Christ and the life that I now live, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And until I'm ready to die to reputation and come alive to God's feelings for me, I'm not willing. How about this one, persecution? 2 Timothy 3.12 says, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. All who live godly. All who live godly. You know, somewhere in the 21st century, Christianity got to be really comfortable. We've been inoculated from any kind of suffering. I'm not talking about trials and tests, but I mean actual persecution for our faith. And yet God says, if you are carrying and bearing the word of God, if it's growing in you and it's going to be delivered through you, there will be persecution. There is a cross to pick up. Come and die and follow me. You see, I believe that Christianity 21st century, especially 2012, needs to kick it up a notch. If the teenage parents of Jesus can kick it up a notch, how much more can the 21st century men and women, sons and daughters of God, begin to step in and say, bring it on. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. On the marketplace, at the job, right now in our nation, where there are nativity scenes, there are banners that say, be reasonable, this isn't true. Let's wake up. We are not a Christian nation. We are becoming a godless nation with Christians in this nation. We are the light of the world, according to Jesus. We're a city that's to be lit, salt on the earth. And in 2012, because I'm seeing ahead, the next two weeks, we're turning a corner. It's been a long recession. It's been a long time. It's been kind of dull. People are kind of, uh, tired of this, uh, wondering what's going to happen, uh, need to bring something forth. It was no different back then. 400 years of silence. God, where are you? God, when are you going to come in and do something? Next week, we're going to have a great message about the stealth of God because he flies under the radar. But, but, persecution is going to sit into this thing. Let me show you what happened. Matthew 2, 13. Now, when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And Jim will cover this in a minute. Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek to destroy the young child's life. Heartache persecution, loss of reputation. Mary allowed the word to come to her. She was eligible. Mary said yes to the word to be deposited in her. She was available. 
And Mary was willing, she was willing to take the cost that it would cause for that word to be delivered through her to a lost and dying world. Mary was a woman of faith and so was Joseph. They weren't afraid, they lived by courage. And I wanna read this definition, definition of courage because I'm supposed to hand this over to Jim a quarter of, and I've got two minutes. <laughs> this is better apply to us. Before you do, Deb, before we get into courage, let me just say this. Three points. One is you're eligible by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to carry something that's bigger than you, just like Mary. Yeah. Bigger than you. Bigger than your dreams, bigger than your thoughts. Bigger than your plans. You are eligible by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like in Mary was deposited by the Holy Spirit, in you is deposited God. Same thing. And it's got to be birthed through you. And that's why you and I need to be available. Available to go do what we need to do without having our own way about this, but God's way about it. And that seems to be the breakdown in the church, is that time between eligible and available. Yeah. And because as soon as number three, the persecution comes, you know, as soon as that uh, price to be paid comes, that's when most people that call themselves Christians back yeah. off and they say, wait a minute, this can't possibly be God. When in fact it is God. If you're gonna get something done with God, carrying something that's greater than you, that'll change the world that you live in. It's going to cost you something, and the persecution's going to be there, but the joy of the Lord should be there. Well, listen to what Mary says. She says in Luke 1, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. She didn't look at the death. She looked at the life. Her mind wasn't on loss of reputation, persecution, heartache, and sorrow. Her mind was on the amazing plan of God, that the word was coming to her. The word was going to deposit in her, and she was going to deliver the hope of the ages, the Messiah himself. And you and I are the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. And God wants to get us pregnant with his word. He wants to develop his plan in us for 2012, and he wants to birth it through us in 2012. But it's going to take faith, and it's going to take courage. Faith puts no limits on God, and God puts no limits on faith. Now, my definition of courage and the man's God. Here we go. I wrote this two years ago. Courage is not the absence of mind-numbing fear. But in the midst of this uncircumcised, irreverent phobia, it is the heroic presence of brave, bold, gut-wrenching, nerve-bending, risky, full-hearted, audacious faith that defies the enemy and looks to heaven for help and victory. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on, Mama. Good. Woo. On top of all that, she made chicken and rice yesterday, and it was great. My part of this is to take you to some place most people have never gone. It's an understanding of a guy named Joseph. We hear a lot about Mary, shepherds, and we'll hear more about three wise men and things such as that as next week, learning the lessons from the manger. But how much just to know there's a guy by the name of Joseph that speaks really loud to everybody, at least should, but hasn't. But today, when you walk out of this place, you're going to have a different understanding about how great Joseph really was. And if Joseph, Joseph can be like great, so can you and I in the things of the Lord. You see, there's something that God looks for, and I have always made a lifetime study in of the word of God, finding out what the character is of the people that God uses. There's a certain character inside of the people that God uses. They all have a common thread that runs through them. And I know this about character. Character is what you do 
when no one's looking in the middle of the night, how you make decisions, how you walk, how you think, and how you will live out life. That's character. You can do it your own way or the ways of the world, or you can have a character that is after the ways of God. And when you have a character that's on the inside of you that's after the ways of God, it changes the world that you live in. Catches the heart of God and the eyes of God, and then God can use you. But I found out something else about character, that character can be developed, and a lot of people don't know that. With God, it's not, you know, what it is. You know how we say that? Well, it's what it is. With God, it's not what it is. It's not what your parents were. It's not what you used to be. God wants to develop inside of me and you a godly character so that he can go through you and me to get the job done to a lost, dying world. And Joseph had this kind of character, so did obviously Mary. I want to read it to you, if I may, by taking you to Matthew, the first chapter, verse 19. Verse 19, it says, And Joseph, her husband, they hadn't yet been married, but betrothed to each other. And in the Jewish custom, when you were betrothed to each other, it was like marriage without the consummation. It hadn't gone that far yet as far as consummation, but it was in the law, they were really married together. And the only way that they could ever really separate in this Jewish tradition is that they had to divorce each other at this point if there was a problem of some kind because they were married as soon as the families got together and brought them together. It just hadn't yet been consummated. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, see the words just man? It says so much about him. And one of the things that we're talking about is the character of a man or woman that God can use. And you see the words just man up there? It doesn't just mean, well, he's a good guy. Someone thinks well of him or he thinks nice things or, you know, he's, he, he lives by the law of the land. It has nothing to do with that. Let me define for you what it means to be a just man. A just man is someone who lives out his life according to the justice of God. He doesn't live out his life according to his feelings. He doesn't live out his life according to his plans. He doesn't live out his life according to what he thinks. He doesn't live out his life according to what people say. He doesn't live out his life according to what the majority of people do. He doesn't live out his life according to his his ideologies or philosophies or anything else. A just man is somebody who lives by the justice of God. What God says, that settles it, and that's the way it is. Even if it means I have to abandon my feelings. Even if it means I have to get away from my own thinking. Even if it means my whole family or friends or the world goes one way, I go the way of God. That's what made him so special. He was a special person. Very few people are that way. We always follow God if... God follows us and is our thing, but as soon as God wants us to make a turn that's contrary to our feelings or our plans, and man, I tell you what, we just flip out. I'm a man. Most men are like me in the sense that we have things planned out. Women, oftentimes you don't know that. And when you bring a different plan to a man, it kind of disrupts their whole life. Like tomorrow I'm going somewhere, I know when I'm going, I know what car I'm taking, I know what roads I'll be on, I know when I get there what I'm going to do, I even know what restaurant I'm going to eat at, and I know where I'm staying, and I'm going, and I know everything about it, and Deborah comes to me and says, I think we ought to do this, makes me crazy. (laughs) Because we're planned out, and Joseph was no different. He was a just man with plans, but yet, his plans, he was... And I love these words. Listen to this. Willing, if you will. Willing to accept God's will. Could you put that up on the overhead? He was willing to accept God's will. Now let's go back to verse number 19 and let's see how it is that Joseph deals as a just man. Joseph, her husband, being a just man, 
and not wanting to make her a public example. Wait a minute. What he just said there about Joseph is he had no personal revenge. At this point, he had not heard from God. At this point, this woman came up pregnant. At this point, he knows nothing else. But somewhere along the line, she's had a relationship with another man. At this point, he probably thought to himself, I thought we loved each other. I thought we were committed to each other. I thought she was a great woman. I thought she was a kind woman. I thought she was a godly woman. I don't understand this at all. This is crazy. And most men would get up and try to revenge the hurt that they have. He had no personal revenge. A godly man has no personal revenge. That's why Jesus said when they hit you on one side, it's a different principle, turn your cheek. Because now you implement the power of God. And he knew how to do that. An amazing man. And he comes along and he says these words. He says, was minded to put her away secretly. He didn't want to make a public deal out of this. Most men would shout it from the housetops, the sins of the woman. You know why? Because that makes him feel good about himself. If I could just put her down, I'll feel better. If I could show everybody how wrong she is, they'll not think I'm wrong. After all, I'm somebody of somebody of importance in this city. I've got a business. I'm a carpenter. Uh, people buy things for me. I build things for them. I've worked years and years and years with my father, my father's father before that, in order to have the reputation of being a carpenter. I've got a business in this city. I've got a reputation in this city. I know what I'll do. I will avenge her myself. I will have a, a revenge against her and I will publicly make a spectacle of her but he doesn't do that now he comes along even before he knows that's the Holy Spirit and he wants to do it secretly because inside of him a godly man doesn't want to hurt somebody else it's not about getting right or being a big shot or someone patting you on the back or getting on your side it's about not hurting somebody God knew the character of this man. He was really quite special. And it goes on in verse number 20, and it says these words, which are pretty powerful. It says, but while he thought about these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You notice how he says, don't be afraid. You know, when you start to move in the things of God and you start to apply a way of life that's contrary to normal, Christ, normal human thinking, but is Christian thinking, there's sometimes fear wants to come in and stop you from doing it. And it's safer to do things like everybody else wants you to do. Them. And he says, don't be afraid. No pressures. The one thing that really got me about Joseph is he took on the responsibility as a stepfather. We were talking about it between services. In case you didn't know this, this is a blended family. In case you never really thought about it, Joseph was a stepfather. This was not his physical child. And yet he takes on the responsibility of this Child as if it's his, and what a great statement that is about that word that we talked about early of being a just man, one who lives justly by the ways of God. I mean, he could have come and said, wait a minute now, you expect me to marry this woman? You have to understand, I've got a holy, I, I, I've got a, a business, I've got a reputation, I've got a, an income, I've got a position, I've got everything going for myself, I have got plans for the future, and now if I marry this woman, there's going to be persecution against me, they're going to talk about me for the rest of my life, and what a sissy I am for marrying her, instead of putting her away like most men would have done, they're going to call me names, I'm going to lose business, I'm going to lose my future, I'm going to lose my destiny, he didn't care, he cared about what God said. The most interesting thing that comes along to me on this is that he comes along and he takes responsibility to be God's man. Put that up on the overhead. He takes responsibility to be God's man. 
responsible to care and to protect. You know, he could have said, wait a minute, God, I didn't sign up for this. Wait a minute, God, this is not my child. Wait a minute, what am I protecting here? A couple of years later, an angel appears to him and tells him something that's very unusual in verse 13 of the second chapter. Notice what it says. Verse 13 of the second chapter of Matthew. And now when he had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, Flee to Egypt and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and they departed for Egypt. Wait a minute, God. You want me to go to a foreign language? I don't know anybody there. My business is here. How am I going to feed the people there? How am I going to feed the children? How am I going to feed my wife? How am I going to take care of my family? What is this all about? My goodness sakes alive. You've got to be kidding me. I don't speak Egyptian. They're not going to accept me there. How am I going to do this? How is this going to work? I didn't sign up for this. Forget it. Get somebody else. This is not my child. This is your child. But he doesn't. What a character examination for all of us. He takes on as a man the responsibilities of this family because he's a man of God. No wonder God could trust him in this area. For all of us that are in here today, we're going to have to be a people that are willing to accept God's will. We're going to have to be a people like Joseph that are willing to take on the responsibilities of the will of God. No one ever said it's easy. No one ever said even it's fun. No one ever said you'll love it. But the bottom line is it's an adventure you can't even imagine when you follow God. Because if God told you to do something and you go do it, he'll take care of you. And Joseph found out how God would take care of his family in a foreign land with no trade whatsoever and nobody he knew, no business, but his family was protected. I don't know about you and I, but all of us that are in here, we need to become what God would have us to be, is just men, people that God can use because we live our life not according to our feelings or our plans, but we live our life according to what God says. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that hurts. Most of the time it does not make sense, but the outcome is an explosion of life. And that's what God would have to say about Mary and Joseph today. If God spoke to you today, come on. You know he did. Give him a great big praise. Will you do that? I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave, and then I'll dismiss you in just a few moments. Could I ask you to just remain seated? Let's talk just for a moment. Nothing could be worse than to come into the house of God Sing songs, clap your hands. Listen diligently like you did to the word of God. Literally hear from God about your own life, which you did. And then to walk out of here and your heart stop and you die and go to hell. Nothing could be worse. And so you need to listen to me right now because I don't want you to go to hell and you don't want to go to hell. And let's talk about what it's going to take for you to get to heaven. A lot of people think, well, I'll just be a good person and I'll get to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you're good you get to go to heaven? It's not in the Bible. A lot of people think, well, if I just love God, I'll go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God you get to go to heaven? Not in the Bible. Some of you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, uh, Pastor Jim. 
I just hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I hope I make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven and you're going to make it. You're not going to make it. Some of you might say to yourself, wait a minute, I've always thought of myself as a Christian. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. You know, took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class. You remember those classes, how boring they were. You know what I'm talking about. But that won't get you to heaven and somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough and honor you enough, tell you the truth, stop playing games, tell you the truth. Listen, you want to go to heaven and you need to go to heaven. You do not want to go to hell, so listen to me. Jesus Christ comes a beaten, bloody mess. They nail him to a cross. He dies. Raised from the dead on the third day, seated at the right hand of the Father, took your sins from you, washed you with his blood so that you could go to heaven. Now, wait a minute. If he did that so you could go to heaven, are you telling me that whatever you think will get you into heaven and whatever you decide to do will get you into heaven? Doesn't matter what your group thinks, you know, you can think anything you want. That's okay too, that'll get you to heaven. Not true. Jesus tells us, Jesus, hear me, hear me. Jesus tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the word of God. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, you can't get to heaven any other way but his way. Any other way but his way. Can't get there my way, your way, some well-meaning church community way. You're going to have to get to heaven his way. And he tells us in Scripture how to get to heaven his way. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I was a leader. I taught Sunday school. I, I sang in the choir. I helped him out there uh, of that church. Great, I'm glad. Could you show me that in the Bible? Because it's not in the Bible. That will not get you to heaven. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you, you just don't understand. You don't, you don't understand. I'm, I'm really a nice person. I give my money to charity, take care of people. I, I go to church every Easter and every Christmas. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Jesus tells us in John, the third chapter, Jesus, how to get to heaven. You must be born again, he says. And he says it to a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Why Nicodemus? Why is it recorded? Why is it in the scripture? Is it just a history lesson? Nicodemus, now listen to this, listen to this. Nicodemus in his lifestyle was probably better than all of us in our lifestyle. This guy was a keeper of the law, memorized the scripture, debated the scripture, sang the scripture. How many of you sang the scripture? Fed the poor in his community, where ecclesiastical church was a, ecclesiastical robes was the head of his church, the synagogue. Wouldn't you think Jesus would have patted him on the back, came to him and said, Nicodemus, man, you're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. He doesn't. He comes to Nicodemus, John 3rd chapter, and he says, you must be born again. And it wasn't built on. You're not getting to heaven by what you do, what you don't do. And you're going to get to heaven because you're born again. Most people don't understand what born again means, but I'll tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. Here's what it means. Are you ready? Here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It is an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. It always has been and always will be all or nothing. I'll prove it to you, okay? I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you that it's all or nothing. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. And he says, I'm coming again. He says these words, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Now, I don't know who I'm talking to in this section, but everybody's getting up and walking out in this section. And I want you to know those distractions are spiritual right now, trying to keep you from heaven so that you end up in hell. And nobody else get up from that section back there or anywhere else in this church service. God by his spirit is moving in this place and I don't want you to get up. You cannot be rude for a few moments and you can wait for God. God wants to do something. 
Don't clap. I'm not, here. I'm not here for your claps. I'm here to do the work of God. Now be quiet and listen to what I'm saying. Your eternal life is at stake. And you listen to what I'm saying to you. Today you need to give God all of your heart. And there's some of you that are in here and you need to give God all of your life. Listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship. He says, listen, when I come, I better find you hot or cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just said? Lukewarm people are not going to make it, even though you call yourself a Christian. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out, little up, little down, token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. And you know it. And today is your day of salvation. And I'm fighting for souls right now. And I'll tell you what, America would be a whole lot better place if we had more preachers that say it like it is and fight for souls instead of playing games with people. And some of you need to get right with God because you're going to open your eyes in hell if you don't give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. That's what this is really all about. And today is your day of salvation. And stop messing with God and stop messing with me. Sit down. Could I get an usher in that section, please? Is there any ushers in this place? I want you to stand right there. Joe, get back there. Joe, get back in that section. You want to mess with me? Come on. You're not going to rob souls from me. Your eternal life's at stake and somebody loves you enough to fight for you. And today is your day. All across this auditorium, there's a spirit of God. And I'll tell you something right now. Let me tell you something. I can walk out of here with a big smile on my face. Man, we just preached the gospel really good. The worship was phenomenal. But I'll tell you what, if I luke, walk water down and cause this to be lukewarm, then I'm not a pastor because I'm afraid of your face more than I am God. I'm afraid of God by not doing my job. Now, listen to me. All across this auditorium, you need to get right with God. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to pop my hands together. It'll sound Sound like this. Bang! When you hear that sound, you get your hand up and put it right back down. As simple as that. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and I do not, I do not want to go to hell. Today is your day. And somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm counting to three. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that, that are not sure, make sure. Today is your day. I'm speaking to you. I'm counting to three. Here it is. Your call. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. One, two. Leave them up. Leave them up. Leave them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Back there on top. Thank you. Fourteen, fifteen. Thank you. Sixteen. Thank you. Seventeen. Thank you. Eighteen. Thank you. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Thank you. Back over on this side. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? There's 24 already right now. Anybody else? Anybody else going for God? There's another one back over here, 25, 26 back here. Thank you. God bless you. 27 back there. Person stood up, walked out, came back, got saved. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And there's three more back here, 27, 28, 29, 30 back here. Anybody else real quick? I'm sorry I'm tough. I am tough. If you, listen to me. If you, listen, if you want a love boat captain, Go find one. You want a pastor? You're looking at one. That's just the way it is. All right? All 30 of you, from the foyer, if you raised your hands in the foyer, stop messing with God in the foyer. If you're in the bathroom, I got speakers in the bathroom. If you got up in there, you better get off that pot and get in here before you end up in the pot. All 30 of you, get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible friend. Get your stuff. Get in the aisle. Meet me right here in front. I want all 30 of you to raise your hand. You're serious about God. Nobody leaves. Get up here right now. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Woo! Come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on. 
Come on, if you raise your hand, get up here. If you raise your hand, get up here. Or if you should have raised your hand, get up here. Let your mercy come here. Come on. Come on. Come on home. You get out of your seat. Get up there right now. Stop messing with God. Come on. It's a mercy that brought me here. Thank God, thank God, thank God you guys have come. It's only going to take a few moments. No weird stuff goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, okay? This is Pastor Dave. He's a good guy. He's going to pray with you give you some free information, tell you about a program we have that'll help you get strong in Jesus so you don't fall through the cracks, but we want you to go on with Jesus. Let us help you to go on with Jesus. Is that okay? Only takes a few moments. If people you came with, they'll wait for you, okay? Make a left turn, follow Pastor.